All right, everyone, welcome to the fourth and final Vignettes Quilt Along Zoom. We are going to be celebrating our quilts right now. I had pretty high hopes that I would be quilting my quilt now or maybe even done, and I'm not. Um, but I, I'm, I'm midway through the process of basting, so that's something. And I am excited to hear about where you guys are in the process and celebrate our quil quilts and also respond to some questions about um, any any phase that you happen to be in the process or any phase that you are anticipating in the future. Um, so I can make sure that if you would like to sh you know, do a screen share to share a photo of your quilt, um, you're welcome to do that. You can also, of course, move your computer or phone or tablet or whatever you've got um, for you to be joining. And um, yeah, I'd love to check in and just see either in the chat or you can unmute yourselves and share um, what, what are some requests or things that you would love to get into today. I'm thinking about what to name my quilt. That's I've watched your recent um, thing with Laura the other day, mm -hmm. and yeah, I'm <laughs> thinking about what to name my quilt. The dog's going nuts. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I've got some ideas. I'm sort of playing with whilst I'm mm -hmm. quilting and seeing which one fits. Were you able to listen to my talk with Amanda Nedig about? Yes, that's the one. Yes, I watched that one as well. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, that one was very title focused. Mm. And then Laura and I dipped into it. And it's been depressing to see how the sound isn't working well on our IG live with me. It was well. fine. I, I managed to watch yeah. it fine. I could hear it also. Okay, yeah, on my phone, it's totally silent. But then if I find it on my computer, I can hear everything just fine. So I listened on my phone and it was. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I want that too, though. <laughs> you need a really old Motorola. That's what you need. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I have an iPhone. So that's the difference. <laughs> All right, well, I would love to talk about titles. I think that that would be a great thing to get into. I think all of those support, you know, quilt support type subjects, and it was wonderful to get to see some people posting about that with the last couple of prompts of things that you want to do for your quilt after you're done binding it. And a title is absolutely one of those things. I'm seeing in the chat, Naomi says that you've never hand quilted. So any tips on basting or hand quilting would be welcome. We can get into that. And then Sarah says, I haven't finished my first quilt yet, but I'm already thinking about my next. Perhaps some thoughts on following this process again. Oh, Sarah, I love that idea. That is excellent subject to dig into. Okay. Um, Sam, we could start with you. I wondered, are you, you know how to screen share. Do you have a photo? Or I could, I could find you on Instagram. Could you? Yeah. Because that is my latest picture in the best light. Um, okay, perfect. Yes. Yes. With its magical light beam that just appeared. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that is a good one. <laughs> All right. Um, here we go. Yes. Okay, so here we can see Sam's quilt. Trying to get a little bigger. There we go. Oh, wow. And that's fun to see how you've allowed your quilting to be a little bit triangular. And now you're going across from side to side. Yes. Yeah, I'm filling in. And I was a bit worried about 
leaving that, I was thinking, I've made myself a rod, my own back. But actually, yeah. it's quilting really nicely. It hasn't bunched up or anything, so that's good. Well, especially, you know, in, in thinking about the question that we had from Naomi about quilting, the reason why, why that pops to my mind when I see it right away is that if you quilt in one area and you quilt in another area, that's a fair amount of trust that then when you join mm. those two areas, they're not going to wrinkle up or buckle or gather or just have some kind of difference between how, how they're coming together. And Sam, I can see that you are basting in a way that's very similar to me. You've got about... I know it's about a hand span, I would say. Yeah, it's more of like a 20 centimeter. Yeah. 10 and they're offset as well. So they're, mm -hmm. yeah, that seemed to work best for me. Um, yeah. And you can even see here how like this pin is maybe pulling a tiny mm. bit. So uh, it's very similar to the way that I like to baste where I'm just marrying the two layers together. But then if I want to bury a knot, I can reach up in there and hide things. That's how I like to bury my knots. When I bury my knots, it's very easy. When I leave my knots exposed, it's not because I was like yeah. lazy. It's yeah. Choice. So I mm -hmm. followed that and I've buried my knots mm -hmm. um, for the diagonal and the curve. And then in this, the middle triangle bit, I'm leaving the knots at each end. So there's going to be a ridge of knots down. Oh, beautiful. Up. Yeah. So one of the biggest things that I've learned over the years is to be a little bit more courageous to do things like what you're doing here. And I think the best advice is um, advice that I learned when I was in a, a, a garment sewing class. And so you want to create some ease in how you are sewing the two together. If you're pulling one side of it really taut and tight mm -hmm. and quilting from one end to the other end, you're going to end up with a discrepancy. But if instead you try to just match even with even and maybe even have a pin or if you're just if it's a garment, say you're doing an armpit on a jacket, you would pin end to end, and then you'd pin center to center, and then you'd pin a quarter and a quarter, and then you would just go from pin to pin, making sure that each of those spaces is equal, rather than making sure the two fabrics are super flat and even mm -hmm. to each other. So then you don't end up with this big buckle at the end. And you can really, like when you're quilting, I would hesitate to add a bunch of pins every time I go across. Maybe if you start to see a problem brewing, sometimes you can get an inkling that something mischievous is on its way before it actually happens. And so then you might want to put a couple pins in just to level things out. Mm. Or change direction. Oh, which is, yeah. That's which is what I've done on the, far, <laughs> on the far right uh -huh. where the oak leaves are. Yes. The curve reaches to right to the edge and it was starting to buckle. So I then just come down and that's just ironed out that crinkle that was happening on the back. It wasn't happening on the front. Mm. Um, but it's good enough. Yeah, that direction that you're quilting. Mm does make a really big difference. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful tip. So yes, um, that looks like it's laying flat. It's looking really beautiful. An alternative option, if you had thought about it ahead of time, would be there's no reason why you couldn't quilt one, two, three, or one, two, three, like to have quilted in an opposite order. Um, yeah. That would be possible if I were doing that what's so beautiful and I can tell you laid a string down on your quilt yeah. and laid a little dot to dot out of safety pins because you can see this line of quilting shifts right at the eye of this rabbit as mm -hmm. it looks towards this red sun or moon and then sweeps across to the corner so it's a diagonal but it doesn't cut in a straight line across the yeah. quilt, it has this beautiful curve to it. And then the way that over here, these two curves match up, 
So it looks, you know, if you were to cut it across here, it looks like just one big sweep across. So it's mm. a really beautiful, um, like confluence, almost like two rivers joining together that you're doing mm. with your quilting. Thank um, you. But had you had you wanted to do it in a different order, for example, I feel like this line is the more um, thoughtfully chosen. Yes. Rather, you chose that one first and you chose yeah. this one second. So you could have then gone in to find the second line and yeah. then put a pretty tight row of safety pins along it and quilted um, you know, with your line starting here and going down to there. Yeah. And then uh, okay. yeah. Across here. And that would be also a successful order to do it in, but because you've got quite a bit of experience and you understand that about creating ease, you're able to get away yeah. with this. <laughs> it's just it's so gonna awesome. fine. <laughs> it's gonna be totally fine. I can tell already. It's laying great. Thank you. I've got I have quilted down to the the bit that says Bel Cinto. I've quilted down to there now. So I've just got that oh. long. Bit. Oh, that's so cool. All right, so our purpose though was not about quilting, although I think that that mm. was helpful for night. We kind of answered Naomi's question by looking at your quilt, which I love. So uh, having looked at it, our goal is to think of a title or to mm -hmm. contemplate titles. Now I lately, uh, I, I recently, I feel like maybe I took the easy way out on a quilt because I didn't know what the title would be. And then I realized, oh, I embroidered a whole sentence on the quilt. Maybe that could be the title. Oh. Uh, so it's, um, it's, I, we've never met, but I've been an admirer is something that I embroidered on the quilt. And then I thought, you know what? <laughs> it was pretty enough to embroider. Um, it's pretty enough to be the title. So one option that comes to mind right away is you can see Belcinto. The quilt could be Belcinto as a title. Mm -hmm. um, that's like kind of low hanging fruit option. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that can be awesome. Like it's easy. It's written there. Why not? Yeah. So that would be one. But what are some of your other thoughts that you, because I can yeah. see there's some other words at the top, yeah. some yeah. text over here. Uh, and there are plenty of other ways into titling apart yeah. from this brand name. So yeah, so where the, are you at? The, word, the words at the top say truly great. And then oh. I've got this map um, on the left, which is which says the world. And then it's got all the um, countries labeled, but they're all topsy-turvy just because of where the cut was. But the one I was thinking, because I love the hair and I loved looking up and I love the bird as well. So I've been playing along the lines of, um, if you, I can't remember what it was now, if you call me, I will find you. Mm. And then I'm thinking as well, um, which I'm, I like this morning and then I didn't, don't like now is we are all connected, but I think that's just a bit too boring. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's not as poetic as mm. the, especially having just heard the first one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that that's that has a very similar sentiment, but it's not um, you know, so to the point and mm. and happy as yeah, we are all connected. You know, I, I feel like there's a t-shirt with that on it. Yeah, yeah. People holding hands all the way around the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if if you call me, what was the end of it? If you call me, I will find you, I think it was. I like the word seek as well. I, um, oh, another one I've well, those are very different right. though. Mm, I know. Of, if you I didn't want it to sound like a stalker. That was my... <laughs> Oh, because if you seek, that's like if you look for me. Yeah. But if you call me, then that's like two parts putting yeah. effort in. And it sounds more, I don't know, supportive, mm -hmm. more comforting, which is, yeah, links to that quilt form of textile. I also, you know, having forgotten the second half of your your sentence like I I wonder even if you call me yeah 
it's a little more ambiguous. It leaves mm -hmm. that question, what will happen if you call me? Uh, so, so that shorter version mm. could potentially be interesting of will I answer? But it's obviously, right, it's not, I'm calling you. <laughs> <laughs> out of the dark, right so it's you've got both halves of that equation mm -hmm. already if you call me and then it's um like you know it, it implies i'm listening and i will answer yeah um and it's not you should call me or will you call me but if you call me is kind of a nice open door yeah imagination uh, is that along those lines is that something that you were thinking about as you were yeah yeah so it's i've been ruminating on it for weeks now um yeah. it feels like <laughs> <laughs> um and trying to yeah trying to figure out i what i wanted yeah i wanted that sort of message of like support with the hair and the bird mm -hmm. the bird looks like it's searching mm -hmm. searching is a nice one um yeah and i like the idea the map link to that and then the blue floral stripe that's got a winding um path through it as well oh yeah mm -hmm. and the, the big really big strip on the other side next to the bird as well that Oh yes, yeah. I see. That's the big floral. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think I've got lots to play with. I still haven't finished yet, so it could all change. But that's where I am. Well, it's reminding me as well that there's so much history of bird calling, of both mm -hmm. you know, cupping your hands to be able to make a special bird call, yeah. as well as there are lots of like like the duck dynasty people right they made all that money on bird calls. <laughs> um but there's also like incredible folk art things like when you go to the museum you can see all of the wooden bird calls yeah. and i guess that also reminds me of all the mm. duck decoys yes those are kind of yeah. hand in hand the decoy ducks as well yeah. as the faking the sound of a duck so there's yeah. there's a little bit of peril involved in calling a duck. Yeah. Um, which is kind of you know, it's, it's just an interesting layer of of you know, it you, uh, like I I personally really like when things get a little bit complicated. Hmm. Um so that could be interesting and also you know the bird the the hair birds of prey are a big deal for them. Hmm. That's that's one of the many ways that rabbits can meet their demise. Yeah. So they would have to be, you know, a goose would be yeah. a potentially wonderful friend, but a yeah. hawk or a different kind yeah. of bird. It's a it's a type of seagull. It's a Balearic shearwater, um, which I <laughs> which is oh, a oh that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bird of current concern in the UK, so it's on the red list. Oh. Mm -hmm. So it's endangered. And, and then the, the hair, the, that particular kind of hair, is that also endangered or it's is not? I think they're protected. You can't hunt them. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With hairs being so like fertile, it's sort of hard mm. to imagine that they might be. Yeah. Or, um, Okay, so if what's the the original one that you're thinking of? If you call me, I if will. If you call me, I will. I find you. I think it was. Mm -hmm. I might have to watch this back. To... <laughs> yeah. I haven't written it down. I'm gonna write it down. Well, and then I guess the other side, you know, if if you call me, seemed interesting on its own, but also I will find you. Is an interesting one to think about all by itself as well. Mm -hmm. And Ooh, if, yeah. is there a play on words with that, like, mm -hmm. I will find you, I will look for you, mm -hmm. I've already found you. Yeah, but that's I'll when I was, I've been, 
that's when I've been thinking, oh, it's going down that slightly stalkerish route now. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's what my daughter said as well. So she's always right. right. <laughs> and then that other title, you know, maybe there's a way to make that mm-hmm. a little bit more poetic. Yeah. Um, that is about the connection, that interconnectedness of the animals, of being on land and in air. I guess mm-hmm. it could also be on water, right? <laughs> like, yeah. So they can be on any of those surfaces. Yeah. On the map. Um, they Ooh, certainly. Cats. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's always something so beautiful too about like we're all under the same moon, certainly with today being mm. a hunter's moon. Like you're in the UK, I'm in the US, we have people. Yeah. Um, you know, Naomi is here from New Zealand. And for all of us, it's the full moon. It's not just for yeah. some of us. So that is also a really, you know, beautiful mm. entry point of even though they might be in very different places, they are both with the moon. Um, at at the same time Mm. Uh, oh yes a a form of titling you know as you know from listening to those other things that i've been excited about lately is choosing a few different words either three words or four words that are connected but don't form a normal sentence Mm -hmm. so the first time i did that it was muse invisible Wait, muse, pandemic, invisible sweetheart. Takes a while to memorize that <laughs> title. Which, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but potentially choosing a few words that hint at it could be another way of doing that. One of the things that inspired me to do that type of title is a title that's always stuck with me from a Mark Bradford painting. Yeah. And it's called Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And there's mm-hmm. just so much that's interesting in repeating the same word over and over, which which I have not done yet, but also that that way, you know, it's not really how you would talk. Uh, it can, naming a quilt or a work of art can be a lot like naming a pet where you have <laughs> extra, you know, a, a dog could be named Pepper or a name, mm-hmm. a person could be named Pepper too, but it could be named, you know, things that are outside of the realm of typical human names. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, even something like moon, 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 or um, connected finding calling, or mm. finding calling. Like, <laughs> when I was a high school art teacher, I had this one student who was very needy and he had this big outburst and he was like Miss Parks I've been calling you and calling you <laughs> just oh, it made me laugh all spring break I would just pop out of the blue and be like, I've been calling you and calling you <laughs> so you know from from me like that's such a, a fun sentence that has mm-hmm. a lot of interesting memories to it of like I've been calling you and calling you, um, yes. that that kind of thing can can be interesting in, in that line too. So I don't know if we got you any further along, but <laughs> lots of food for thought. Thank yeah. you, and thank you to everyone's suggestions as well. It's been really helpful. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, because I'm screen sharing. I didn't add. Yeah. No, there's lots of things in the chat. Oh, excellent. Okay, let me just read a few of those. Um, oh, call me like from Blondie. Yeah. And just thinking about song titles, I think in general, mm. a popular way to think about titles. Um, Caroline says the rabbit would like to be so high up in the sky with a wide view. Oh yeah. Just, you know, that like the, the grass mm-hmm. is always greener on the other yeah. side, but it would be so interesting to try out. Um, Will you guys sign your quilt on the front like Heidi and Zach recommended the other day? Did I recommend signing on the front? I've never signed a quilt on the front before. I, I was going to do the back, but not the yeah. front. I generally do the back. 
um, because currently in the art world, it's a little bit faux pas to sign things on the front. So as soon as everyone gets used to the idea that artists sign things on the front, like Jackson Pollock and Monet and whatever, uh, now, uh, like, like more contemporary painters don't do that so much. They usually sign things on the side or on the back mm -hmm. um, because they don't want to disrupt the visual on the front with the signature. Uh, so that's where I land more. Although my vignettes quilt <clears throat> this time around has my signature, my name that I embroidered without looking from Zach's class with the playful pause with the makery. Um, so, so my quilt does have Heidi written on the front twice, once as a straight line and once as a circle, because that's what happened when I was using the embroidery hoop. Um, but I think I think I was even attracted to signing it with just my first name because I wanted it to be part of the art and not count as my artist's signature. Because I also had a, one where I didn't look and I signed my whole name. So um, that's an interesting question about, yeah, certainly you can sign your quilt wherever you want. And a signature anywhere is better than a signature nowhere. Uh, but I, I don't have any experience with signing on the front. Although, yeah, Zach's into it. Luke, I think, always signs on the front. Uh, Naomi says there's an amazing song called I Am Calling You. Active present tense can be nice. Yeah, just I think you know, Sam playing with all the different tenses and going through the thesaurus that they're really different. There's such a different energy in that subtlety of tense. Okay, and then, oh, good night, moon. That does that make me think of that a little bit. Um, Caroline's asking that red sphere, is it something particular for you, Sam? No, it was a little, <laughs> it was a block that I made ages and ages ago, which I was only allowed to use scraps from my scrap thing as they mm -hmm. came out. So that was a jam pot cover once upon uh, time. <laughs> I, yeah, my mom perfect circle. <laughs> makes so much jam and I, that's why I have all those strawberry prints. Yeah. Because <laughs> she was always buying strawberry fabric to put as the yeah. circles on the jam jars. But I liked, it does look like a sun or a moon or something in, in a valley or something. I like, I like that, but it wasn't, it was just the scrap that came out the bag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I like that. Sometimes that adds one of the most mm -hmm. special or, you know, ambiguous, the most interesting. Um, that, that reminds me of our talk last time where I was bringing up Sally Mann and she was saying, if it doesn't have ambiguity, don't bother. And yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's so beautiful that you don't know specifically what that is. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Naomi, um, was that helpful with talking through basting and quilting as well? Awesome. Okay. And then our very, very helpful. Thank you. And um, particularly even just things like how far apart to have the safety pins, that kind of thing is oh, I've got two cats trying to join me now. This is great. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh oh, no, fighting times. Um uh, yeah, no, very helpful. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Okay, and then we've got one more question from the very beginning, I believe. Ah, uh, yes, so Sarah, you were talking about your next quilt. So Sarah, do you, can we share your, your current quilt? Hi, uh, yes. Um, will it let me share my screen? Um, yeah, or if it's on, if you've posted it recently on Instagram, I could just share it for you if that's also good. Oh, good. You know how. Awesome. <laughs> well, I've actually got three uh, layouts that I've been looking at. Um, so this is just one of them. Um, I don't know if it'll let me change. Oh, there's another one. There we go. So um, I've been playing with layouts. I still have um, some blocks to finish that I've been working on. So I've been putting some of my text blocks into log cabins i'm sat here stitching um so i think the question and i've discussed this i'm in a accountability buddy with two other quilters who are on today um i love I that think, you're part of a, a three 
three yes. three person accountability triangle. Absolutely. That's so very sturdy. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so I think we'd all said, obviously, the first time we're doing this, there's an element of the unexpected because we've been following each prompt. Mm -hmm. um, and so while, like, obviously, my color palette was very limited, um, I've not limited myself in how I've responded to each prompt. And I think the question is, are you more self-conscious almost? Does it limit you when you have seen the process through? Mm. And if you're looking for another one. Yeah. Well, I would say for me, with this being the second time that I've worked with the pattern, I, because there's so much open choice to what you're doing, I felt really interested in trying to make different choices from what I did the first time. So if I used a feed sack that said you know, seeds or chicken meal or egg mash or whatever on it for my text block, then this time I thought, well, let me embroider some text. And previously I had a lot of color in my quilt. So then I organized it based on a, having a more monochromatic neutral colored quilt this time around. I also even just in laying it out last time I laid it out and organized my blocks based on visual movement. That was my top principle that I had in mind for that. And now this time, as you saw me laying it out in the last zoom, I laid it out based on uh, the element of value and creating that grayscale. And then uh, so, so I would say for me, I definitely had the impulse to try to take the pattern to a different extreme. I did that with the quilt along for the scavenger hunt quilt as well. I made the initial quilt almost under duress. Like I had to make it really fast <laughs> for the magazine article that it was going to be published in. And then the second one was you know, under a really different kind of duress with the quilt along being in March of 2020, but, but a very different situation. And so there also, I wanted to try to push the pattern to an opposite place. And it's a different experience when the world's your oyster, you can do anything you want. And then you're trying to add add something or say something different or just push push the pattern in a different way. I would say as well for both of them, the second quilt was done during a quilt along that I was leading, which I think is a different sensation than participating in a quilt along. And um, you know, so that that would also be a really big difference in my experience with the two versions which would not necessarily be your different experience your different experience would be part of a quilt along and then quilting or piecing independently so that would be the main energetic shift that would be inherently really different for that second time around uh, i like though that you know, when I was first getting on Instagram, I would feel like, well, I posted my quilt. I guess I'm done now. I got to make another quilt before I can do another Instagram post. So I hope that the quilt along, you know, kind of stirred your brain for just different ways to interact on Instagram, different kinds of posts to make, posts that raise a question where you're talking about these are my different composition options, or maybe pushing you to do a reel or go live or do a story or um, you know, those real zoom in images versus a zoom out of the quilt. So, um, you know, even if you were doing it independently, hopefully you could go back through those different prompts and be reminded to share your progress with people rather than making a quilt in secret and then just posting the finished photo. So that would be a really nice um, difference. I do think that for your second time around, it could be fun to, to try the more open-ended version of the pattern. And I, um, let's see, let me pull up that last page of the pattern. So if you stop sharing, then I can screen share. And let me just find, I should have had that open before we started. It should be quick to find. Uh, 
Okay. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> all the way at the end of the pattern. Uh, there's a page on variations. Okay, so here's your quilting and then at the end are variations and it says adding just one extra rule can make a big impact in the quilt pattern. So you kind of already did that this time around, Sarah, because you chose a very strong color scheme and you stuck to it. So even letting go of that variation that you chose could be a really interesting new version of the quilt pattern where you don't have that super strong color scheme. You could also, um, you know, choose a block and explore things within that block you could um, just do some of the prompts. And then the ones that are really exciting to me is what if you make a lot of blocks for just one element or just one postmodern principle? And then I suppose that's funny. I feel now like I also wrote down here. <laughs> um, like what if you just expanded one of the vignette blocks and made it really big? So for example, if you loved the prompt around obsession, what if you took just that block and you made one large quilt based on the prompt for that obsession block? Um, that that could be a way to still use the pattern as a jumping off point, it's one of those really good kind of training wheels things too of like all of us artists have all of these um, elements and principles and postmodern principles and that's oftentimes a jumping off point for making art all on its own so it kind of gets into that that gray area of are, are you even still using the pattern or not um, in in a really wonderful way and i like oh now you're just your own designer and that that could be a fun a fun next step it's because i was doing the quilt along i wanted to stick to the pattern more um, this time rather than one of those jumping off points but i really like the idea of thinking about obsession and making a, a quilt top that investigates that or doing one of the prompts over and over and over again so how might i make a block that's about color and do that over and over and over again. So those would be sort of the most extreme variations, but then the, le the least extreme ones would be still do all of the prompts, but create a different rule. The first time you had your color scheme, I would say even Sam's quilt was an interesting angle of that where she's been thinking in the back of her mind about this relationship between the bird and the hair and that idea of if you call me I will answer that that have it, having a more conceptual idea like that in the back of your head that if if all of your blocks were in some way a call and response or connected to a different type of relationship um, you know Sam is interested right now in this kind of distance and um, and, and connecting to the natural realm, but maybe even if you wanted to like explore your own friendships or like your relationship with um, a particular person, or even like the, you know, it, like I, I've made a lot of art inspired by Marcel Proust and his book, Remembrance of Things Past. So if I were to take a version of this quilt pattern, but be thinking about Proust's book, that would be its own different version of the quilt pattern in a way that would be really stirring and fun to do. I would say you know, my quilt I've had in the back of my mind that this would be uh, part of a series that I've been doing. Oh, and I can probably stop sharing now. <laughs> so that this would be part of a series that I'm doing called Neutrality Study. 
And um, this would be number four. So neutrality study number four. And that's part of why I thought, oh, how cool to just use neutral colors. That's been a very successful color palette for me. And then it's funny because I, I did at the last minute, let me share my version because I haven't, um, I, I have an update <laughs> on my, my quilt being a little further down the path. <clears throat> So here the other night, I was, uh, I had this negative space that needed something because I didn't want to bury the binding of this adult diaper in my binding, or you know, I didn't want to bury the edge of that. So I needed something to go around it. And I don't remember where I was or who I was talking to, but someone was recently pitching to me the idea that green was a neutral color because it's in nature. I think it was probably when I was in Madeline Island teaching, we were so surrounded by nature. Uh, and I, I certainly, with neutral colors, I feel sometimes like yellow is so much like tan that where does tan end and yellow begin? So I felt pretty comfortable with adding this yellow to my neutral color palette. And then um, I, uh, in the past, have added red and certainly here my name that I was talking about, how I embroidered my name, that's done in red. And I generally think of neutrals from kind of a fashion point of view when you're getting dressed and what is what is a neutral color and they talk a lot about how red would be a neutral so here that idea that that sunk in if anyone remembers who it was that told me <laughs> that green was a neutral I'd be curious I don't I don't remember but I do think it's sort of fun to play with and stretch what is a neutral I think you also in your quilt that you just shared had kind of a limey green color in there that that was also mixing in with your neutral color palette. So for me, that felt really fun to add in a neutral. I was not feeling great about that long stretch of polyester that I had from my skirt. I remember we were playing a lot with that last last time and there were a lot of fun things that I could have done with that. But I, just, I wasn't I wasn't feeling excited about the polyester aspect and dealing with ironing and accommodating that fragile fabric. So I went in my stash digging around and I found this rabbit print and I thought, oh, rabbits are a sign of abundance. That's part of why I like them so much. And the layering prompt is about abundance and repetition and that kind of constant production of things. So I thought maybe symbolically the rabbit would be like abundance and layering as well as being a print and most of the other things on most of the other imagery in this quilt is embroidered like the embroidered eyes and the embroidered pattern over here so a print is much faster and more modern technology than hand embroidery is so that felt as well like the layering uh, layering prompt so, and that was a, that fabric was gifted to me by someone in a work, in the first post pandemic in person workshop that I taught at the quilt museum here in Wisconsin when I was teaching this quilt pattern. So it felt like a kind of a nice full circle moment of having gotten to teach the pattern in person finally. And then the generosity of my students there, which is also, there's a certain abundance that you have to have in order to just give people fabric so freely and generously. So I liked how that uh, that print layered in ultimately at the end. Um, yeah, does that does that have you stewing on some ideas? Yeah, next quilt? yeah it's, it's been such a, a lovely process and so different to the way I would normally work, uh, which I'm sure is the same for a lot of us. Um, and I think the time pressure has been helpful in, like you say, in posting every day that, you know, you've not had, or I've not had too much time to try and get things perfect or, or absolutely right, which is, is quite an exciting way of working as well. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's been good. Thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. 
Well, thank you very much. I saw we had another comment kind of a while back from Gwen, and I see you've got your quilt on the floor. So if you are able to stand up and unmute, I think this deserves a spotlight so we can see your quilt. Oh, you're not unmuted. Oh, there you are. You are. <laughs> Am I okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hi. We missed you last time round. I know. We've been um we've been away actually. So it's really nice to get back and do a bit of stuff on the floor again. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can we see your quilt on the floor again? Yeah, yeah. Hold on a second. Huh? Oh, nice. I love that you had an extra bit of your hand and is that your sample for the one that you can put your hand in yeah this is um <laughs> yeah you can put your yes. hand in yes um and i've really i've been doing various workshops over the years and um as i was pulling everything out so i've actually been able to incorporate most of the different bits and pieces from either like a maquette like this or um you might recognize that oh the camera's not picking that one up but there's a play here which is the blind stitching on Zach's um oh you did that too <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. That's um yeah just all sorts of just different bits and pieces that have really come together quite nicely and I'm just um ages and ages ago it feels like it I worked out a layout and luckily I took a photograph mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, I'm just kind of trying to recreate um one of the layouts that I quite like um, right. But of course, it never fits back together again the way it did the first time around, does it? <laughs> it must. <laughs> it would have to. <laughs> yeah. It certainly I, looks awfully similar. Yeah. I I, that I, circle. I'm really, I see that. But I guess the thing I'm just really struggling with now is um, because many of the fabrics are really different thicknesses, like mm. there's some like paper thin so i'm having to put some fabric underneath some of them uh -huh. um, which yeah just it's just that whole how do you get the balance between when you're sewing one vignette next to another uh -huh. or on top of another you know it just yeah so i'm just trying to work that out at the moment yeah no i understand what you're saying i in this quilt i also did a really broad range of transparent voile really gauzy thin fabric and then of course like my my adult diapers that are so thick and bulky with like three layers of fabric yeah. uh, one thing that i did a lot of and you can see me doing that in the talk the live that i did recently with laura hartrick hopefully with audio if you're not an iPhone user, yeah. uh, that I just kind of kept a lot of things on the floor and you could do that very easily as well with a table if that feels better for your body but I kept them laying flat and I did a lot of ladder stitch so that I didn't have to pick it up and disrupt it normally I pin things and then I trust those pins enough that I'll piece it floating in my hands but I think partly because because my layout was so complicated and big <laughs> as I was piecing to it and because yeah. of different weights of fabric it just felt easier to to stitch everything down on the floor and I I had a, a few good phone calls with friends while I was stitching and then I watched a lot of my current tv show that I'm binging and and I I felt fine doing that on the floor and piecing things down. Uh, so maybe piecing with the ladder stitch would be a helpful adjustment to to be able to mm. keep things laying flat. But also, yeah, I wouldn't be shy about putting extra beefing up those thin ones. If you did two layers of thin fabric, that can kind mm. of pull one layer of standard fabric. And that could be helpful. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to, and that's a really neat idea about the ladder stitch, actually, because I'm trying to pin stuff now, and even as I'm pinning it, it's moving. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't try to pin the whole quilt in one go. I would try to divide it into segments, 
and I can actually let me show. Yeah, let's see. Um, just scrolling through to the right page. Okay, so here. Oh my goodness, which window are you guys in? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so here on the second page of our quilt pattern, you can see this drawing that I made. And I loved seeing a few people do this, oops, do this same drawing in the quilt along where you were planning out how you're going to piece things. So these lines that I've done represent the way that I've stitched my vignettes to each other. And the color coding yeah. is the way that I stitched them. So the red lines are from the sewing machine where mm -hmm. I had relatively straight lines or where I cut the curves to match and I stitched them on the sewing machine. The green lines are where it was laying, where I did more of the, the ladder stitch or that where I pinned it. I remember sewing that with it in my lap though it wasn't on the floor with the ladder stitch like I was doing recently um, so here these green ones are where I pinned and then I hand pieced them together yeah and then this area is where I did um, that safety pin piecing that I like to do where I just lay the one on top of the other and I safety pin it down and then the quilting holds it in place I never mm -hmm. applique stitch it down um, yeah so so those are the different ways of piecing but i think you can also see you know i didn't show every single line if you look here for example this rectangle that's my texture vignette mm -hmm. this is a quilt block that i found so that was my appropriation i think and then this is my layering block these are four pinwheels as well as an extra strip of fabric to make the pinwheels match in scale with this found block. So I sewed these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces of fabric to each other kind of early on so that then they could easily be sewn to these other pieces of fabric. Yeah. Um, okay, that's, that's really good because actually, yeah, so kind of just breaking it down, subdividing it into finding a little area that you can piece together in an easy way. <laughs> and then you only have that big unwieldy thing to piece together a couple times. Yes, no, that's really good actually. That's really helpful. Yeah, no, that's um, a good trick. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I find that to be one of the most helpful aspects of vignettes piecing. And if you think about a, um, a like traditional American block quilt, where say you've got 36 log cabin blocks and you're sewing them together, you don't do a bunch of right angle seams where you add one to the next and you just keep adding like that weird seam. What you do when you piece that is maybe you piece four of them together. So you're finding four blocks and you're sewing them to each other or you're sewing it as a strip quilt. So you make a row of six and a row of six and a row and then you sew those rows together or you make your block of four and your block of four and your and then you sew those together into a block of eight and a block of eight and a block of eight and block. And, and so that's the same idea of piecing them together slowly without without being really tricky. <laughs> yeah. So to so working small to big, instead of adding one little thing at a time to your big quilt. Yeah, and then I guess looking kind of further ahead, the other bit I'm thinking about is um, quilting. So mm -hmm. I've got a few um, just like super detailed embroidered pieces like this one. Oh yeah. So there's like there's a million French knots on here. It's just, mm -hmm. So um, I'm also just sort of thinking about how to quilt this. Um, and I'm just going to have to, you know, I know Sam and I have spoken about this before. I'm just going to have to be brave and stitch over the top, just quilt over the top of it. Um, kind of. 
I, yeah, in, in several of my classes that I teach, I like to share about that. I have kind of a sequence of PowerPoint images of close-ups of my quilts that have had a lot of embroidery and how I address that. Uh, I think actually in like stitching together kindness with the makery, I shared that, which I think you took that class. So yes, uh, yes. where I, let me, let's see, let me find that PowerPoint. That should be easy to find my professional PowerPoints folder. Now that I've remembered which class it's in. Um, Is it on one of the MQG lectures as well? I think you did. I don't think I went as in depth with that particular aspect. I know I showed all of my quilts at a distance but I didn't show them as close up, or at least I made other quilts since then, so I added to it. But yeah, that, if, if you don't know, if you haven't quilted before, that webinar that I did is a really good resource. It's, it's for MQG members only, but I think it's $30 to be a member, and then you have access to all of the webinars from everyone including three webinars from me. And it's uh, the one that I have on hand quilting is very in-depth. I have embedded videos in there and I show a lot, a lot of good stuff. So here. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay, so this is a block where I had a lot of text embroidery and it looks like I've plowed right through it as I was quilting. And this was a volunteer, like I quilted this as a volunteer. So I did a two inch gap instead of my usual one or less inch gap. But when I got close to the letters, I, oh, I thought maybe there'd be a close up. So when I got close to the letters, you can play with your over and under stitch. And I strategically made my under stitches not interrupt things. For example, here you can even say where it says 100 days into quarantine. Look what a big understitch for me <laughs> is between that that one and that zero. I, I was trying to accommodate the letters. Now here you can really see a good close up of how I was quilting over this text. Um, and for example, again, I made sure my understitch was under the L in less rather than over. So a lot of really thoughtful, like here I'm right next to a little knot. This is a double tailor's knot rather than being a French knot, but you can see how I, I snuggled right in there rather than being over something. I also had a, a particular width that I was stitching the whole quilt with, but I didn't want to plow right through a layer. So here, uh, where I'm talking about, this is a quilt about, it's called Winter 36 Times, and it's about how much I love winter, which is mainly because I suffer in the summer and don't like being hot. So in between less sweating and less showers, I realized, oh, I've got to make a bigger gap. So here you can really see that I, the quilter, made an accommodation, as well as down here for more knitting and more crisp air, which I'm enjoying the air so much lately. Uh, here you can see it just gets a little fatter around these rather than plowing straight through. Mm -hmm. And especially within the context of the class, stitching together kindness, where I try to ask the question, you know, what is a kind stitch? What does it mean to stitch thoughtfully? And I think this is a nice little microcosm moment that has sort of a beautiful macrocosm interpretation as well of, yeah, if someone needs something extra or if the, there's a larger goal, then I can slide myself over. Like I can create a bit of accommodation. I can think about, you know, equity versus equalness. And, um, you know, I, Gwen, seeing your work in the past, I know that those are issues that are really near and dear to your heart as well. And I love that like, here's a visual of 
me giving my embroidery what it needs, giving it the space to go around. So that that's a really special black. Now this black is mistletoe because I love the romance connected with winter. And I've got some French knots as well as the back stitch. And here you can see that I was a little bit more devil may care with how my quilting went over things. And I like that as an idea of kindness as well. Like there's room for both. <laughs> we can both do our thing independent of one another. And so here I've got some stitches that are plowing right through the middle of my mistletoe leaf. Uh, I didn't go through a French knot. I think that might have been kind of uncomfortable. But here I'm right next to one. The French knots are kind of big, so it's sort of easy to toggle your, your stitch to be a little bit under the knot rather than on top of the knot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's what I did right here. Uh, this is a house plant that I embroidered since since then it's died. I always feel a little nostalgia when I see this <laughs> plant embroidery. It was a gift from one of my high school students and I kept it alive for many years, but not not forever. And and so here as well, you can see I'm really just stitching away through here. It's it's so many leaves and you don't lose anything the way that you do with text by having mm -hmm. that quilt, like you still know it's a house plant. So I've just gone right through and there's there's space for both. Mm -hmm. This is a map of the, the last home that I lived in, in Naperville, my hometown in Illinois. And here you can see, I've got the train tracks and the river and my home was over in this area. And again, I've, I've quilted pretty casually over it and it's turned out fine. This is my main childhood home. I lived over here. And again, um, you know, just like quilting across it and it turned out fine. There, there are some over stitches over the back stitching as well as a stitch that comes out right through it. And then of course the under stitches and that blend worked out pretty well. So it's I, I think it's nice to get to see those close ups. This is some applique that I did. And here, you know, the overstitch on the edge of the applique can be nice to ground it to make it look a little more embedded. That's what I, I tend to favor that way of stitching. But you can see clearly there are moments where it was an understitch as well. So here with this white rectangle, the understitch is at the border rather than the over. And there's nothing wrong about how that looks, even though I do more frequently have the, oops, <laughs> I do more frequently have the over stitch there. So, um, and this is nice to see these block quilts. These are more in the Baltimore album quilt family where I'm telling a story and each block is unique rather than each block being courthouse steps or or some other kind of knowable block but it's 36 squares and I pieced them all together very accurately and so I didn't like sew one to one and then sew another one to those two and then I you know and keep adding just one block at a time I very much divided the quilt into quarters and I sewed these nine to each other probably as strips so I did a strip of three, a strip of three, a strip of three, and then I sewed those strips to each other. And then I sewed the two top ones together, probably sewed the two bottom ones together. And then the only really unwieldy thing that I had to do was a single seam across joining those two. And so that's a uh, you know, traditional American patchwork technique of working little to big. And it also applies for the vignettes process rather than sewing one little thing to your big quilt at a time to try to divide it down uh, is helpful. So, uh, oh yeah, and then here's where I sign my name. And again, I quilt, a lot of times I embroider my name at the end after I've quilted it and taken the photo, <laughs> gotten the quilt image off to wherever it needed to go. Uh, but here, you know, it, it always turns out just fine as well so i'll stop sharing that and Brilliant. yeah i'm glad you brought that yeah, up about you. your embroidery because there's a lot of embroidery i think in this quilt pattern where you're encouraged to do some 3d things and 
um, being aware of that over under certainly applies with things like pleating or pin tucks and lace and uh, all kinds of mischievous things. Yeah. You can really make any choice that you want. Yeah, no, I, I think it'll be fun actually. Um, and it's a great tip about breaking it down. So I think my next step will be just to play around with where the obvious breaks are and just try mm -hmm. and work out how to get it into more sensible chunks really. Yeah. yeah. I remember when I was first quilting that 36 block together and I was so tempted to make a big long strip. <laughs> like, like that was my first impulse was long strips. And then I realized, oh, <laughs> that that's going to be more painful to do than it needs to be where I'm sending this big long strip of quilting through the machine over and over again. And I really only have to do that big pain in the rear one time, not six times. So yeah, that'll be really helpful. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing that. Let me thank take you. a look again in our chat and see. Uh, we've got we've got about 20. These have been all around 90 minutes, so I'm comfortable with staying that that length. Um, Actually, there's a lot of things in the chat. So does anyone want to use the raise hand function, even if you already typed your question in? OK, no urgent takers. I'm going to read from um, Julie asked. She got here late, but um, how do you decide how to quilt and which color thread? OK, so we. We did talk a little bit about that with Sam in the beginning, so you'll see some of that. I was sharing that a lot of times I'll lay a piece of thread on the quilt and then move it and nudge it around and see where that line looks good to do my first line or direction of quilting. And then I'll do a kind of dot to dot with safety pins so that I can, or straight pins depending on the moment and how I'm feeling. Uh, so then I'll, I'll quilt along that and then I'll just echo that one line afterwards and I don't need a hair a pen or a special marker I can just use my eyes to figure out where to go. But I do the same exact technique for figuring out the red color so i'll lay a single strand out it's a it's remarkable how you know this looks so pink and bright in the spool by itself, but when it's just a single line of thread, it can almost read as white in a quilt. But what's nice is it, it looks different from that really bright white of actual white thread. There's a softness to using a pale color thread that's really lovely. So considering using, even if you think you want white, maybe kind of a minty green or a pale pink or a, uh, you know, a powder blue can be a softer, really intriguing color to use, as well as do you use just one color or do you use a lot of colors that are kind of friends with each other? Sometimes when I do dark lines in a quilt, I'll use black and brown and navy blue and forest green, and they kind of all read the same at a distance. But then there's a reward or a surprise when you get up close to the quilt where you realize there is more nuance there than you thought when you were far away. And you know, again, that's kind of a beautiful metaphor for life as well, where things look the same far away, but then when you get up close, there, there's a lot more diversity and uniqueness to discover. Uh, but yeah, laying it out so it's just a single strand and then remembering that it won't even be that bold because it's gonna be a dotted line when you've quilted with it, I think is very helpful for getting a preview of thread colors. And I will grab, when I'm in that process, I'll try to grab colors that I like think would be horrible <laughs> and just look at them because sometimes choosing the one that seems like the worst choice I could possibly make actually ends up to be really lovely in the quilt. And I can tell that a little bit more when it's just a thin line. Okay, um, Lila, let's have you unmute. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just, I was asking you to unmute and I muted you. So you'll have to unmute one more time. Thank you. Hi. And Hi. share if I pronounced your name right or not, I'm not sure. 
Yeah, Lila's perfect. Okay, good. Um, so I've put, yeah, I've got a question about my uh, title as well. Sure. Um, I have sort of, uh, there are a few things sort of repeating elements in my quilt. So the idea of play um, and uh, moon imagery as well. I've been looking at the moon a lot uh, during my quilting, which has been really nice. Um, and yeah, I'm just trying to find a way to kind of bring those two ideas together uh, in the quilt title. Um, so I sort of my first thought was maybe playtime on the moon, but mm. yeah, I'm not sure. I'm yeah, I'm not sure. One of the things that when, when I think about a verb like play, I often think, how can I do that verb rather than say that verb? Mm. Uh, I love a good online dating analogy. And, and so they like, <laughs> there's a lot of good advice for like your dating profile that's that way too. Like, don't tell people you're funny, make a joke, show them that you're funny, or post a funny photo of yourself goofing around. Like, then they will see that you are funny, or you will actually make them laugh instead of just, I'm so funny. <laughs> um, so, so this kind of thing is very similar where rather than maybe using the word play, I think about what games are connected, like, like what would be a game or a playful form of speech? Uh, I immediately think of like the cow jumped over the moon or, you know, like other, other kinds of word games even. And those aren't coming to mind. Maybe we have a few that could pop up in the chat if you can think of other rhymes or playful things or games that one might play in the moon. Uh, you know, one, one word that I, that I like that I learned is from my, my friend Sarah, who had a company called 11000, and now her company has changed to being called the Good Day Market. But she hired a marketing team to come up with the name 11000. And I remember talking to her and asking her, like, why is it called 11000? And she kind of just said, like, well, I don't know. <laughs> that's what they suggested, and that's what I went with. But as I contemplated 11000 more, I thought about, well, her brand is all about slowing down and making handmade things. And so I think about when you're playing tag and you close your eyes and you can't just count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You have to say one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three. Like it's a phrase that's about slowing down. And it's also a childhood game. So there's also an element of play in the phrase one, one thousand. Uh, you know, like the only times where I talk that way really is when I'm playing. And, and recently got to, to play hide and go seek with a five-year-old that I love. And so that was really special to be like one, 1,000, two. So if there's language that you can think of that's like that, that's connecting to play or that's playfully connecting to the moon. Um, I was just thinking about cheese too, right? Like the moon is made out of cheese. Here, Sarah says hopscotch on the moon, or the man in the moon came down too soon and asked his way to Norwich. That's a good one. Uh, so, so some other kind of playful, I don't know, is that feeling inspiring or jogging? Any ideas for you, Lila? Yeah, it is. And I think, the, yeah, the reason I wasn't keen on playtime on the moon is because it felt a bit obvious. Yes. Um, and yeah, like you said before, not very poetic. Sorry, that's my husband with our baby. Oh. <laughs> I hope I'm not being pulled upon. Oh, you're definitely uh, in like, you know, good night moon, moon rhyme phase of life when you've got uh, one. Very, yeah, very much so. <laughs> I've got a one-year-old and a three-year-old. So yeah. Oh, yeah. Our, our, yeah, our three-year-old talks about gathering dust on the moon quite a lot, um, like oh. gathering moon dust. Um, so oh, yeah. maybe it would be nice. This is way of saying he loves that. Yeah, that he loves us. He says he's going to go and gather moon. Um, loves us all the way to the moon and <laughs> gather 
Sorry. Mm. <laughs> it's oh, gonna those are beautiful. Um, so yeah, maybe could I pull up your. Personal. Could I pull up your quilt so we could look at it? Yeah, sure. I'm Nine Lives. Uh, Nine Lives <laughs> Studio. I want. Well, I'll, I'll mute myself. Yeah, I tend to know people's handles more. We were just messaging, I think, this morning. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I loved how you posted this with your drawing of how you might quilt oh and i guess this one must be for a tie quilt right okay and then this is maybe a slightly further away view yeah i what changed size is your quilt um it's about i'm gonna have to talk in meters mm -hmm. it's about 1.2 by one meters okay Wonderful. So um, a little smaller than a wingspan, like maybe yeah. a hand to yeah. an elbow. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm immediately loving the way these hexagons kind of look like the Milky Way on here. Oh, yeah. OK, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, like moon dust. I also I love the movie Stardust with Claire Dean. Claire Danes and Robert De Niro. That oh, it's a beautiful romantic comedy movie, and and there are a lot of plays on words where you say something and then they kind of take it a little bit too literally. Um, it, it's one of those things where like a person can be a star. Uh, lots of lots of magic mm. in the movie. So that could so that one is called Stardust, which is fun to think of different kinds of dust. Certainly, I also think of like fairy dust from Peter Pan. So, um, yeah, something something connected to that, which is language that is a regular part of your family, I think would be so beautiful to do stardust. Um, it could also be fun, like if this is like the milk, like, like making up a new word that's a little bit confusing, like um, milk dust. Mm. like the milk yeah, <laughs> dust and like also mothering and I imagine like milk is a constant subject of of conversation in the house when you've got <laughs> little ones um you know like like something just a little bit disorienting can be kind of poetic and nice in a title um, and it goes back to Sally you know Sally Mann mm -hmm. kind of talking about the ambiguity and yeah. Uh, bringing that into the title as well yeah mm -hmm. yeah um oh my goodness i love the 3d of this that's crochet right not knitting uh it's knitting no it's knitting oh it is knitting mm -hmm. wow um oh that's gonna be so much fun i also think you know as you consider your quilting i can see why why maybe you're thinking about um, this this would be like a tie quilt here, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's so much of the flavor of a shooting star or being being dusty, like specks of dust mm. that that could be connected to that type of quilting. It could also uh, be fun yeah. to do both. Uh, for example, what if you made this big shape that's in black? But then rather than using a different color, what if everything around that was a tie quilt? Mm. So it had oh, sort of yeah. a 50, 50 mix of, of tie and running stitch. I also yeah. really like, and maybe, maybe you were just trying to draw quickly, but the way you get this little loop in here is, is not of like most of the time when quilting has this kind of line to it, it's more like this one. Mm. But it's so pretty seeing this little squiggle and that wouldn't be a particularly hard thing to quilt in to have mm. that be true for your quilt. Uh, 
that to me that feels very playful mm. almost like a spring or a you know like a slinky kind, kind yeah. of to it so if you want to infuse more of that energy of play i i read the way that that looks as being incredibly playful mm. Mm. so to really quilt it with that little extra loop in there I think would be lots of fun. Yeah, I have, I've started quilting already, but I've done the lines a lot closer than in the picture. And I'm thinking yeah. it's not really working. I need to make it wider. Okay. And like you say, maybe having some little ties mm -hmm. um, kind of peppered around, you know, in between to kind of support um, the, the batting a bit more um between those you can also quilt overlapping so whatever color you've been using so far for your tighter quilting because it's also my um, usual choice to quilt tighter than what this drawing is mm. but you do your tight quilting and then in a different color and maybe even on a thicker thread or even like mm. if your eyes are done with yarn like you could also quilt with a a yarn <laughs> you you want to mm. test it to make sure it feels okay on your hand it's not mm. worth hurting yourself over but if you have something in between a sock weight and a worsted weight a, a slightly thinner yarn mm. could quilt with yarn to make these big loops in a bolder color or even just because it's thicker it would it would read that way and that yeah. could be a fun um yeah extra, extra like where, where then you meet both needs of having this big playful loop going across the quilt but also wanting it to be quilted tight enough that you can you know wash it and have it lay flat and do all of the mm. functional things that a quilt would do and maybe that would be a good way as well to say um to have it visually make sense that it's quilted in multiple ways Mm. It's the tie mm. quilt and it's a running stitch quilt because that's not a super popular choice in the quilt world. I've I've done that a few times, but usually people ask me questions on my Instagram posts, like, what am I going to do about those ties later? <laughs> and I was answering, like, they're, they're doing it. Uh, so the, having a third way of quilting with yarn could be a nice way of like, yeah, I chose a lot of ways to quilt rather than just two ways to mm. quilt. Mm. And that in itself is kind of playful as well, isn't it? Yes. It's sort of experimenting yeah. with different, um, mm -hmm. yeah, different textures. Yeah, yeah. And then it's showing and doing instead of telling, which yeah. I think is yeah. just always so exciting, it gets your point across. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing about that. Okay, let's see. It's always hard to remove all the spotlights. There we go. And I'm gonna shift back to gallery mode so I can see everyone. Um, let's see, do we have, oh, and I, I love how you guys are chatting in the chat. Yeah, the Milky Way, it even makes me think of like the candy bar, the Milky Way, um, like candy dust, or there are a lot of, um, Oh, this make sure you read through these, Lila, because those are some really good, good insights on the word moon and playful ideas. Do we have one more person who would like to share their quilt or talk? You can use the raise hand function to let me know. There's so much good conversation. It's a little bit hard to read through the chat to find that. And if we don't have anyone, that's fine too. We're kind of on the cusp of being, oh, good. I, Yep, and you've got that. I know you're not cat, but yes, I see your hand. Unmute. <laughs> I guess it's my turn to be cat. Yeah. Last what time a it was weird someone else's turn. turn. <laughs> yeah. So I am in the piecing stage. And um even just this morning, I, you know, did a different, like I changed things around and did a different thing. Mm -hmm. But what I'm, you know, it's like you, um, it's not this thing. Um, so, 
you know, you, it looks like, oh, these things will fit, but then you kind of have to like <clears throat> add little bits and, yeah. you know, to try to make them actually fit. And so, you know, that's kind of where I am, this puzzle of uh -huh. what do you, you know, do. And so I'm, you know, kind of just trying to like, I don't like that there's so much math in quilting. You know, you want <laughs> you want it to be that it kind of works out. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard sometimes to um, you know, fit it and finagle it. So that's just I kind of wanted to put that out there that that's where I am. That you know, yeah. that whole like how do you you know, let me put a little fabric around this and then fitting it. So it's really, um, that's where I am. Okay. I, and I, I thought, you know, other people might be in the same place and, and feel like, why is it just so easy for everybody else? And, and it's not. <laughs> yes. Um, so number one, I do not use a lot of math, like actual numbers. Yeah. Um, the only college class that I ever took on math because I went to art school. So it was a geometry class that was about Euclid's elements. And so it was pre geometry, pre numbers and angles. And I really loved that. I learned so much. And I think that, that I carry that math class with me where I just think, well, let me join like with like, or let me, uh, when I, I'm gonna be teaching a class on Friday about a framed quilt should have one with me, but I don't. Anyways, framed kind of like the way that this piece behind me is framed on a wooden stretcher board. And everyone has a different frame that they bought at their own store. So I can't say your frame is this many inches on the side and you need this big of a border on the front. And then the so there's no particular inch that's perfect for that. But what I teach in the class is to take a piece of paper, and you fold your seam allowance, which I encourage to be an in, a half an inch rather than a quarter of an inch. So you've got some wiggle room. And then you match that up with where you want the edge to be according to your frame. So if you want a nice deep frame, you can do that. If you want a skinny little frame, you can do that. But then you wrap that piece of paper to the side, to the back, and then you put a little tear in the edge and then you don't really even need to go to a ruler to measure how much is that. You just cut a strip of fabric that's as long as your quilt by the, uh, the, the size of the paper that you've ripped and you're just matching like with like. And the number is not the point and is not what matters. It's just you, you're finding something and then able to find like with like. And that is something that I do when I quilt a lot too, I don't um, pre-cut so often as I will have a piece that's obviously too long and I'll sew that to the piece that matters and then I'll cut off the extra after I sew it. Right. In this particular quilt, I, I had a couple occasions where things weren't a convenient size. So for example, this was my color block and this was my hybridity block. And I sewed the shorter hybridity block to the longer color block. I chopped off the extra. And then later I popped the extra of my color block down here. And that worked out to go next to my representation strip. Similarly, uh, this is part of my, this is my shape block an orange rectangle inside of a yellow background. And the extra of that is right down here. It's sort of covered by my red line. Oh, I could just show you the actual quilt. So you can see down here is this little strip of orange and the yellow background. And that's the extra that I chopped off. So just because your vignette was made that size when you made it, doesn't mean it has to turn out that size when you're done. So you get, to choose and chop things down. Uh, for, for my appropriation block, I chose these three blocks. So one, two, 
and then this is the third and they were they were mailed to me by a woman barbara in florida she was de-stashing and had something she thought i would like and she mailed a little care package to me so here these two blocks i left as is but it made a little bit of my own mark by altering them and it was convenient for filling in this area of the quilt had i had more pinwheels maybe i would have put the extra pinwheels there but i didn't and cutting this block in half was a good solution. I also had some places like what you're talking about where I just needed a little extra filler. And to me, that was a wonderful opportunity to create more rhythm and unity in the quilt to have shapes and colors and things that repeated. So mm -hmm. this repurposed curtain that I used for my hybridity block I used a strip of that fabric down here just to make this little section the same width as this block so that then it would be easy to sew together. So this, this here is a strip and my obsession strip with all my strawberry prints matches up with being the same length as this found block. And so then here, this this was form i had some of that trapunto on there so that ended up being a little bit smaller than it originally was and i cut a curve in this chicken fabric to be the size of the pinwheel but you can see i've also cut off the edge of the pinwheel <laughs> the part that i cut off is down here where the pinwheel starts to distort with my little scraps of it because i wanted it to be the same size as my value block and here i did a little bit of fancy hand piecing to make value sort of add up to those uh, but another place where i did this technique of adding a strip of a fabric that i had used to make a vignette is over here this is the blue that was in my color block and i just added a little strip there down here again is the stripe from the curtains from hybridity i think right here yep this is just the, the extra strip that I cut off. So you can see here it's shape and then these green chickens and then my value, that yellow gray scale. So here I had to cut off an extra part of that so that it would match with this. And then I used that scrap at the bottom. And it, it's just this wonderful moment of value in the quilt. I really like how that looks. I think it makes everything look like one whole more than the separate blocks. So those would be, I think, my top two insights on the problem that you're having of cut something to match and then just scrap the excess, <laughs> cut it off, and then reuse to add in little bits of extra things. Yeah. And then I also wanted to share my, my current version of the quilt and show you how I solved those problems in a slightly different way with this new quilt. Okay, so here I did a lot more overlapping and applique uh, hand piecing rather than machine piecing. So for example, these three vignettes of line, space, and hybridity I sewed them to each other with a straight running stitch. I, I wanted to make a cute little reel, so I hand pieced them, but I could have just as easily machine pieced them. You can't really tell the difference. Uh, but then I went around the edge and I just turned the edges under and I attached that as applique onto the quilt. I also, I was just using a scrap of transparent fabric when I made my form block. But I thought, let's not cut the extra scrap away. Who knows? Maybe it will do something interesting later. And it was this weird shape. I didn't cut the fabric, but it, it started to create a nice visual rhythm with the way that this edge formed, with the way that this edge was a scrap of something that had this longer strip over the edge. Even this is my... Uh, shape block where I put this silk shape inside of a linen 
background. So they were both black fabrics, but you could see the shape in there. I feel like that's such a similar shape to what happened to be on this scrap. So allowing some of those moments of rhythm and repetition, I think were helpful in my composition as well as, um, I wanted to keep this value scale thing, but I also needed some filler in here because the diaper wasn't quite big enough to reach that block. But I didn't want the bright yellow in there because then it wouldn't, you know, that would mess with my gray scale. So I just fussy cut this fabric, which was my economy block, where I just, I was like, this fabric is the economy block. So here I was able to fussy cut it. So I had more of the brown in the plaid and not that really vibrant yellow. And then that helped keep my grayscale moving in a way that I wanted. I also think though some of the most successful parts of the quilt are where I broke the rules. Uh, the way that my value block, I made a very long value block while I was zooming live with Amanda Nadig. And so I've got this black that's up here because the value block kind of repeats itself rather than being one long straight stream of value. So do, doing something a little bit wrong once in a while can actually be really right in the overall composition of getting that little bit of dark up on the top of the quilt that's supposed to be the light part of the value scale. Uh, here, this is part of a shirt. That was my appropriation block. So I used the shirt in two places, here and here. So here you can see the buttons and I left, so far the buttons are on the quilt. And then this is just the natural armpit, the natural front of the shirt tail. This is the area where the buttonholes I cut it off just shy of the buttonholes that seemed a little bit too thick to quilt through. Uh, here's the pocket and I just temporarily have this fabric shoved in the pocket. I would like to find some kind of cute handkerchief to just shove into the pocket and then safety pin applique quilt down to have a little pop of color there. Uh, but I think leaving some of the weird shapes was helpful in this quilt. For example, down here where I applied my just juxtaposition block, I really like the way it's just a little too big and covers over my shape block. And I think I repeated that way of working enough times where things stop a little short or are a little funny or overlapping with that ladder stitch applique that that. Um, it works because I did it enough times. And, and share with us, since you're not Kat, what is your first name? Melanie. Okay, wonderful. So yeah, I'm, I'm MPV 61. Oh, good, Instagram. thank you. Yeah, yeah. So Melanie, does that feel like it's giving you some way is into problem solving? Yeah, and actually what you said about the curves, there's this little spot uh, here where, <clears throat> This, you can't see it here, but this is cut off the mm. corner because yeah. that's from a flower sack. The background is from a, a literal flower sack that I, you know, took apart. And uh, so I'm going to try and find a way to have just have that raw and have that, you know, just sew that over so it's not just hidden in the, in the seams because oh, I love that little bit. I think one of the really pretty things that happens as well in a lot of traditional American quilts, one of the spots that always catches my eye and I love it is where you can see evidence that the fabric was precious or almost out of it. And to make a little triangle and a block, there are two pieces of fabric that were sewn together and usually mm. the print is even matched up, but you can tell, oh, it must've been scarce. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so that kind of thing could be lovely too, to find a similar shade of off-white to match with that. Or maybe color. something bright, take a bright yeah. piece just in the corner, put the flower sack over it mm -hmm. and, and make some obvious stitches. Yes. Yeah. Maybe. To not hide it quite as much as it would have right. been. Right. Would just peak, just be a little peak of maybe like the, the teal or something and, yeah. and just, yeah. Yeah, I need to I need to take a good photograph of it, but that green that I put in the bottom right corner of my quilt 
I didn't have quite enough of it. And so you can, you can, I, I kind of obviously with black thread pieced my little scraps together to fill in part of it. And I think it's, you know, it's just a beautiful moment of um, attention to detail and something that there's such a rich history of quilters doing that. That it's it adds interest, really. <laughs> it adds interest. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm sure that that is a very popular question for people. So I'm glad that you asked it. And then Caroline is not cat this time around. <laughs> so I see your yeah, hand is up. Okay. We'll have you be our last, um, our last person to share. How are things going with your quilt? Uh, I just finished piecing the quilt top and I wanted to give credit to Melanie because uh, her blog with the uh, capital letters red inspired my blue um, vignette. Ah. So, thanks, Melanie. And uh, I, then I just wanted uh, to encourage people to look at my profile in Instagram. I'm White Timber Cottage, and I'd like some help with uh, the name for my quilt. Mm, that is a great thing to be able to brainstorm on yeah. your post. Um, so that was it. So yeah. maybe something with there is no blue in the quilt at all, but the word blue and maybe somebody can think of some idiom. Uh, I don't know because I'm not a native speaker, so mm -hmm. that will be helpful. Well, and you also have that chicken block that is like a fun nod to my chicken block. Yeah. So that could also be a fun way in for the yeah. title. Yeah. I just had the idea to uh, make a border from Liberty fabric all around because all this can only happen um, when we are when we have the liberty to do what we want. Mm -hmm. um, think about this. Oh, that's really beautiful as well. Well, thank you for sharing that. And that request, I think, is so helpful. I'm going to return to gallery mode so we can see everyone. But uh, I think I think that's a perfect note to close on because even though today is the last day of the quilt along in its very official capacity, it's not the end of the pattern, and we're not like done with our quilts. And you know, as we know, we're also kind of never done with a quilt because it can live beyond. And you can do a throwback post like three years from now. You can say, "Oh, I was." enjoying reminiscing about my vignettes quilt today and <laughs> remembering all the fun and 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 those kind of throwback posts are wonderful too like don't forget about a quilt just because it's been done for a while it's so nice to show people and remind people about the great quilts that you've made in the past but to continue using our vignettes quilt hashtag and to keep supporting each other to keep checking in with the hashtag to see what conversations are brewing it's a wonderful way that we can kind of override the algorithms as well to um, you know be able to support each other and have a community around the quilt and piecing is to on purpose go into that hashtag you can also follow a hashtag the same way that you can follow a person. So I know some of us are, but I would encourage everyone who's participating in the quilt along to follow that hashtag because then it will pop up in your feed and you will organically be able to see um, future progress on the quilt and of course give your insights because people will continue making the pattern. I'm sure the quilt along has, I, I know for a fact, the quilt along has inspired people to buy the pattern. And so they're just beginning that journey. And you guys have so much wonderful experience and insights having worked on it and made the pattern that your comments and feedback would just be invaluable to people who are starting out with the pattern now. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to do a lot of continuing to support each other and continuing to do the things that we were testing out and, and interacting with during the quilt along. Um, all right, well, thank you everyone. I, I have just loved getting to be part of this and seeing the community rally around the pattern and being such an open-ended pattern for me, it is amazing to get to see the results and the variety of outcomes that we have and all of the fun problem solving and um you know who's feeling like like your vocabulary grew this month 
and like what a thrill that is so really have fun in in every corner of instagram using that vocabulary i i can't tell you how much i love when i get a really thoughtful intelligent articulate comment on one of my quilts that i post um, i get so many heart emojis and wow this is beautiful but when someone writes a real sentence and says like the rhythm in this quilt is amazing, or I love how you juxtaposed this and that. Um, it really makes me pause. And I always then, when I get a post like that, I always click over to that person's feed and I see who is it that wrote me this clever comment um, every time. So if you want people to come over and look at your feed and to see what you're up to, um, you know, sharing that kind of generous comment and feedback is a great way to have really powerful interactions online in general. So have fun, have fun busting out your vocabulary. And one last thank you to everyone, and we will continue to be in touch going forward. Thank you, Heidi. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. <laughs>